This week on Quality Digest Live, we speak with executive coach Lolly Daskal about her new book, The Leadership Gap. Plus, why banning laptops from airplane cabins doesn't make sense. That and more when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for June 9th, 2017. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. That he is, and I'm Quality Digest publisher, Mike Richmond. Well, you know, there are several organizations that support and encourage efficiency and productivity in the U.S. manufacturing industry. One of the best and longest lasting of these is the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which was begun in 1988 through an act of Congress. The MEP program was intended to help small manufacturers remain on the cutting edge of technological innovation. It still fulfills this mission faithfully and effectively for thousands of companies across the country. Good, good program, the MEP. Now, however, the meat cleaver of Damocles is hanging over the federal budget, leaving the MEP in clear and present danger of losing its taxpayer funding. And that's the theme of the article, MEPs are essential to rebuilding American manufacturing competitiveness by Michelle Nash Hoff, the president of Electrofab Sales. The article first appeared on the Industry Week website last month, and we linked out to it in Wednesday's issue of the Quality Digest newsletter. Ms. Nash Hoff's article is similar in many ways to a piece I wrote in February titled Manufacturing and the Federal Budget. In both cases, these articles laid out the case for keeping the MEP program, which costs taxpayers about $130 million annually, yet generates more than $2 billion in incremental sales volume for participating manufacturers. Yeah, like I say, it's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. <laughs> $130 million in the course of the federal budget is nothing, uh, but $2 billion in, in, yeah. in trackable benefits from it. Uh, the Nash Hoff piece presented interviews with MEP partners in California, Ohio and Kentucky, all of whom can point to concrete examples of sales revenue that was generated as a direct result of MEP support. Now, readers of the article on Industry Week pushed back a little bit on this notion, and, and to be fair, we got some similar feedback to our article a few months back also. One of the common themes in arguing that the MEP program should not should, should be defunded is that if it's really helped generating something on the order of 18 bucks in new sales, for every dollar invested, then private investors, not to mention executives themselves of these small companies, would be lining up to pour money into the projects. Well, that, that's a fair point, but it should be noted that MEPs around the country do raise money through local private investment on a dollar per dollar basis to the funding provided by the federal government. So they get a dollar from the federal government, they have to raise a dollar on their own. So that's the way it works. Um, and obviously, uh, if the federal dollars go away, the, these alternative sources of funding are gonna have to be increased significantly. In addition, the manufacturing projects funded by the local MEPs are not only about increasing profit, of course, it's a big part of it, but knowledge sharing and the expansion of technological expertise are important too. The money received by local manufacturers, often in the five-figure range per project, so not a lot per project, uh, help these companies stay on the cutting edge, again, of industrial innovation, and thus help ensure the competitiveness of this key U.S. sector overall. The bottom line, I think, is like Nash Hoff, I believe that the MEP program really is an important support to this country's manufacturing industry. Hopefully the 2018 federal budget will maintain this relative pittance, as we're talking about, that it's gonna to take to continue funding it. Uh, we're gonna see. I mean, I, it's going through the budget process right now. We're gonna find out as the year rolls along if the MEP is gonna remain funded. And you know, Ball just lost their funding right. um, a couple of years back. And, and, and they managed to keep, they managed to keep, keep it going. going yeah. I mean, but it's harder. I mean, yeah. it's harder. And, and yeah, it's a fair point that, you know, if that kind of invest ROI is being turned on the dollars, there should be able to be a replacement for it. But it's not all about the problem. But see, what, one, one of the, the problems I have with that argument about, um, well, you know, if it's, if it's generating so much money, why don't you fund it, uh, you know, privately? <clears throat> I look at it and say, okay, well, if you're going to use that, that same argument, um, why should the government step in and help, you know, help, uh, you know, with, with uh, you know, uh, fewer regulations, uh, or you know, with with uh, grants and so forth right. to to industry to help a particular company. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like, like well, carrier. <laughs> like carrier, exactly. So I mean, <clears throat> it, you know, either government is going to support something that helps industry as a whole, or they're not. 
But don't cherry pick which companies you're going to support and think that that's going to do anything to the economy. I mean, you, you really, to support the economy, you, you're either going to have to get government involvement that's going to say, okay, we're going to support industry in some way, but yeah. that affects everybody and not just one company or two companies, or just say, okay, we'll leave it to the private sector, but don't do this kind yeah. of this piecemeal kind of thing. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, I, you know. I, I, I agree. And, and it, there, there is not a lot of logic sometimes to the way that the budget does get allocated for things like this. The, right. the cries of, of crony capitalism always come to the fore, and people right. say, well, the government shouldn't be involved in private business anyway, and, and all this, and, and those are fair arguments. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's true. I mean, if you're gonna have a, a, a purely capitalist system where you know, only the strong survive, you know, then yeah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to give that money to those companies, but that's not the system we have. We have a blended system where there's supports as well. So it's, yeah. it's complicated, it's Derek, compl it's complicated. <laughs> All right, so if I say the word hologram, mm -hmm. anything come to mind? Gem. Gem and the holograms. This, <laughs> my nieces have, have this, they... It never works. <laughs> it never works. No, you're supposed to say the holodeck on Star Trek, but that's come the, on. I, I read your script. See, that's, that's the hologram See, and the holodeck are two very different no, things. No, no, it, it's the holodeck is like, it's a big hologram, you're a, you know? You're such a geek. Well, you know, if you haven't watched Star Trek, the holodeck was just this idea where it's a hologram the size of a room and you can walk into it and the computer generates an environment that you can see and interact with with your eyes. Now, we're a long way, <laughs> Gem the holodeck, oh, <laughs> Now, we're, 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 we're a long way from having a holodeck. But actually, we are getting closer to having real holograms. Maybe something like we, we, you see at the beginning of the first Star Wars, right? Where Princess oh, Leia yeah, comes yeah, 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 yeah. We are very close to having something like that that we can use in everyday life. And this is thanks to researchers at RMIT University in Australia. A team led by RMIT University's a, uh, a team led by RMIT University's distinguished professor Min Gu has designed what they call a nano hologram that is simple to make can be seen without special goggles and is 1,000 times thinner than a human hair. Wow. Now, according to Gu, the problem with conventional computer-generated holograms is that they're too big for electronic devices. And you can Google some of these devices to see them in action. They actually are pretty cool, but they're large kind of desktop kind of devices and they do create a hologram. RMIT's ultra-thin hologram overcomes those size barriers by being very, very small. And the cool thing about it is that it would allow you to integrate holography into everyday electronics. So things like uh, screen size, for instance, would be irrelevant. You could use your, your smartwatch or your smartphone to project a full-size screen or even a, a, a 3D model. So once we are able to create holograms for small devices, we have the potential to transform a range of industries. Now, some have called holograms the next disruptive technology, and of course, everything gets called the next disruptive technology. But in this case, I think it could be true. I mean, if you've been around long enough, as I have, to see changes in computing, you can think about uh, how computing itself uh, has inputted, has changed from text-based computing. I don't know if anybody of you out there worked on DOS. I mean, mm -hmm. computing, in case you haven't seen it, used to be typing characters into a screen, right? And then it moved from that to graphical computing systems like you know, Mac, uh, the Mac OS or Windows systems. And this is really kind of the next step. With holograms, we won't be physically constrained by the size of the screen or having to have a keyboard and mouse at our fingertips. You could have a little watch, mm -hmm. and that watch will project a full-size screen that you could interact with mm -hmm. out, in, you know, out in front of you. Yeah. you know, I mean, so this is, I think this will be disruptive when mm. it gets to that point, and it is actually getting really close. Uh, the, the t there's some amazing technology yeah. out there, and if you look at demos of the desktop versions mm -hmm. of holograms, it's pretty trippy. Pretty, pretty trippy, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I think eventually you'll actually, and this does sound like sci-fi, but I think it's true, I mean, they'll you, your eyes will just track, so there'll be a tracking of your eyes, so right. as you just flick around a hologram, it will enter the data, or you'll be able to acquire the data just through flicking your eyes over it. And then once we have our brain implants, well, that whole thing well, will go there, there you go. All right, I can't wait for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dirk. All right, well, one of the topics we cover extensively here at Quality Digest is leadership, because no organization achieves excellence arbitrarily. Those at the top need to be the ones that generate and sustain the kind of planning that will result in positive outcomes for a broad range of stakeholders. This reality is the reason why the development of leaders is so important for quality-centric organizations. 
Many great leaders want, many good managers, I should say, want to be great leaders, but very often there are gaps preventing them from achieving their goals and being their best selves in the workplace. Being able to see those limitations and work with intent to overcome them is the difference between someone who will supercharge their career versus one who's gonna stand still or maybe fall behind. A new book, The Leadership Gap, What Gets Between You and Greatness Can Assist in This Endeavor. It's written by Lolly Daskal, a noted executive coach, trainer, speaker, and author, who also happens to be one of QD's most popular contributors. She joins us today via Skype. Lolly, welcome to Quality Digest Live. Well, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> Thank you for Thank joining you us. Yeah, really, really a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, well, I wanna start off by, by setting the stage a little bit here regarding uh, where we are culturally in terms of leadership. You know, in recent decades, there's been an emphasis on, on uh, compassion, empathy, humility, what some would call servant leadership. But now the top leader in our country is, is none of those things. So are we, in your opinion, entering a, a different era of leadership? So interestingly enough, it's a great question. Even though our top leader is not what you would call a servant leader, doesn't mean each one of us can take our leadership seriously. And I think the best leadership starts from within. Even though there are some leaders that we don't admire, there are some leaders that we don't wanna emulate, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that means let's work on who we are in order to create the kind of leadership that we want. Well, what, now what have been some of your experiences? You've, you've obviously worked with a lot of leaders uh, in your career and you, you've, you've done some great work there. So, you know, what have you seen? What have you seen that, that works better? And, and is it kind of a cultural thing within individual organizations or, or do you think that there's kind of a hard and fast rules about uh, how to be a great leader? So I have been in my business for over three decades. And when I first started out, we had the kind of leadership that greed was good. Then leadership became into values leadership, character-based leadership. Now we see that we're going back a little bit to the greed is good kind of mentality when it comes to leadership. And what I think and what I have seen that really works, that gets the kind of results that you want in your organization and within your leadership is when you work more on who you are than what you are doing. My company's called Lead From Within for a reason, because I believe that every single person in the organization has the privilege and has the, um, I would say, has, can, has the opportunity to become the kind of leader that they wanna be. So I have been teaching and coaching for a very long time that if you want your business to grow, if you want to have the kind of organization that you can admire and that people want to emulate, every single person has to become the leader from within. And that means you have to know who you are and what you stand for. You know, in your, in your book, you refer to seven leadership um, archetypes and, and the gaps that exist between them at their best and at their worst. So how can leaders better manage these uh, polarities and live more on, let's say, the good side of these spectrums? What a great question. We have to, first of all, realize that we need to embrace both the good and the great, both the bad and the gaps, because we are a whole human being. There's been too much literature, there's been too many books, there are too many blogs and articles talking about how leaders should only concentrate on their strengths. But the truth is, we, not, we are not only our strengths. We are people that have flaws. We are people that have gaps. And what we need to do is leverage those gaps. Realize what they are and then learn how to leverage them. So in my book, I talk about these seven archetypes that on one side, you can choose greatness. And on the other side, the polarity of character is the gap. And we have the choice in every given moment to decide who we're going to be. Are we going to be the leader that leads from greatness or are we going to be the leader that leads from our gap? So referring to the flaws, um, you, you have some strategies to overcome them. I mean, obviously that's part of coaching is to help people understand their flaws and to help them overcome it. So what would you tell aspiring leaders about recognizing their flaws and, and maybe some tactics for overcoming them? Absolutely, so let's take one of the archetypes as an example, and I think it would help people um, 
digest it and understand it in a more specific way. So the first archetype is the rebel. The rebel is an archetype, is a leader, is a manager, is an entrepreneur, is someone who wants to make a difference in the world. They want to make an impact in the world. And the way they need to do this is by the virtue of having confidence. But for me, confidence isn't standing in front of the mirror and saying, I'm great, I'm the best, I'm wonderful. Confidence comes from your capabilities plus your competence equal confidence because confidence is believing you're able but competence knows you're able and when you know you're able that's when you take action but my research has shown that 99.1 percent of us that have all these confidence and want to make an impact in the world suffer from the imposter syndrome and that is the leadership gap when you suffer from the imposter syndrome it comes from having self-doubt so in order not to be the person that feels like an imposter who has self-doubt, the book talks about how we can leverage that. It's not that it's not part of us, it's still part of us, but we have to learn how to leverage it. And the first thing is, is to realize that when we have the imposter syndrome, when we feel like a fraud, when we feel we're not worthy enough or deserving enough, it comes because the inner driver is that we're busy comparing ourselves to others. So the first thing I talk about in the book is stop comparing yourself to others because it'll just give you more self-doubt. And the book talks about many other ways to leverage it, but if you can understand the drivers of the imposter syndrome, it would help you not be a person that has so, has so much self-doubt about who they are. Well, Lolly, let me, let me touch a little bit on, on the Im imposter thing. Do, do you think people are imposters on purpose or do they become imposters because they're maybe put into position of leadership when they're not ready and so they think they have to fake it to make it? What a great question. That is a great, great question. The imposter syndrome has many drivers. It could be a leader that's put in a position before they're ready. It could be someone who grew up and had a coach that said, oh, you're really not good at that. Or it could have been a classmate Something. The imposter syndrome is birthed from all kinds of situations and opportunity and circumstances. And for every single person who feels it, and that's most of us except for 1%, it comes from different stories. It comes from different scenarios. But it always has the same feel. I Maybe I should fake it until I make it, and I don't believe that. I'm a true believer. You don't have to fake anything. If you have the competence, if you have the capabilities, it will give you the confidence that you need in your new position and in the circumstances that you don't feel ready for. Well, Lolly, we're, we're coming up, believe it or not, on the end of our segment already. It was a great segment. But I want to ask you, I want to end with kind of a philosophical question, if you don't mind. Um, you know, the, there's a thought, I think, that, that leadership, uh, obviously, is a very human endeavor. It's a human-based endeavor. So maybe it's more art than science. But I, there's other ways of looking at that. So would you agree or disagree that, that leadership is based in art or based in science? It's a great question. As a, you know, I studied philosophy and I studied psychology, so I think it's a human endeavor because leadership starts from within. It starts from having heart. It starts from having humility and empathy and authenticity and trust and all those wonderful things. So it's a real human endeavor, which we turn into a science. Well, Lolly Daskal, uh, great, great segment there. Really appreciate you joining us here this, this afternoon on, on Quality Digest Live. Uh, her new book is The Leadership Gap. Um, you can find it everywhere. Um, Lolly, uh, thank you so much for joining, joining us again. Thank you for contributing to Quality Digest, letting us run your stuff. It's always very popular with our readership. And we'll have you back on the show uh, sometime in the future. Right? We appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lolly. Thanks, Lolly. All right. Have you been as dubious, I guess you'd say, of the actual value of, I don't know, taking off your shoes, taking off your coat, taking out your laptop, getting rid of any liquids or gels, or giving up your small little pen knife, all of that before you go through a TSA checkpoint? Uh-huh. Uh-huh, yeah, well, I have. And so have Cassandra Burke Robertson <laughs> and Irina Manta, both of whom are law professors and authors of the article, Why Banning Laptops from Airplane Cabins Doesn't Make Sense. 
Their article was spurred in part by the United States considering, only considering at this point, banning laptops and other large electronic devices in the passenger cabins of airplanes flying between Europe and the United States. And this has come about really because uh, of recent reports that suggest terrorists can now create bombs so thin that they can't be detected by the current x-ray screening for carry-on. So the idea is if they're moved to the checked baggage, they're going to be subjected to a bit more rigorous inspection. And that's kind of the argument for doing this. The authors look at this issue of banning laptops and other TSA regulations from a cost-benefit perspective. So the benefit, say some, is obvious, increased safety, right? But what are the costs? What do we lose by, as consumers by implementing safety strategies that have perhaps little benefit? Um, they're, they're, is there really value for the consumer? Are we losing value? So let's take a look at a few things. According to the authors, first of all, there's lost productivity. Uh, they point to some number crunching done by Yahoo Finance writer Ethan Wolf Mann, and he says that if we implement the laptop ban, it's possible we could see a 500 million, half a billion, uh, dollar loss due to lost productivity mm. of business people not being able to crack open their laptops and get some work done while they're flying you know, from Europe to the United States. Yeah, a lot right? of downtime in those. Uh, it's a lot of downtime, exactly. Trips, yeah. A lot of those guys have their laptops open. You've seen sure, them. Sure. Uh, second, the authors point out the possible impact to tourism, which combined with the president's push for a travel ban has potentially made the U.S. a less friendly travel destination. So those are the costs. Now, yeah, I, I think there's some validity to these num numbers. I think they're a bit inflated. I think they're a bit sky is falling kind of numbers. But okay, let's say there are some costs. I don't think you can doubt that. The question is, does the potential benefit of a safer flight outweigh the loss in productivity? And the authors don't think so. And a lot of travelers, myself included, I think, don't think so either. I mean, think about it. TSA confiscates my inch and a half long pen knife, but they let me keep a pencil, mm -hmm. a sharp pencil, a pen, mm -hmm. my razor. Mm -hmm. Anybody, any watch Shawshank Redemption? How do you think right, they make right. <laughs> <laughs> shivs? I mean, yeah. come on. I mean, you want to put my laptop in the baggage compartment, and I don't know what, if it goes boom yeah. there, that won't be bad. I mean, the locker, locker bee bomb was in the baggage compartment, and that didn't turn out so well. Right. And you can make the same sort of arguments about limiting liquids and some of the other TSA measures. And all for what? Any figures I can find, and there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of them out there from insurance companies, actuarial numbers, mm -hmm. the odds of being killed by some sort of terrorist attack, you are more likely to die in the shower, getting ready to go to the airport, or die driving to the sure. airport, or being struck by lightning walking from your car to the terminal than you are to be killed by a bomb on the plane, right? right? The odds of it happening are astronomical. Yeah. In reality, they aren't re increasing safety anymore by a heck of a lot by adding on to the measures that are already in place. So why do it? The authors, in a sense, kind of put the blame on us, on the consumers. And here's why. Something bad happens. There's, you know, there's a, 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 a terrorist gets on board a plane with, you know, a, you know an underwear bomb or a shoe Whatever, bomb or yeah. something like that. Everybody freaks out. And rather than try to understand that these events are, in the scheme of things, really, really rare, we demand our politicians take action. Sure. You know, you got to do something about this. I mean, my God, this guy got on a plane with a shoe bomb. You know, he, he could have killed hundreds of people, right? Yes. And of course, the politicians got to look like they're doing something. So, yeah. okay, they do something, and you got more regulations. They get added on, makes their constituents feel good, and it does probably make a large proportion of the public feel safer, feel even if they safer. aren't really all that much safer. Right. And of course, then we all complain about the hassle of, <laughs> of air travel. I mean, this is, I think, a classic case of giving the public what they want, even if it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, so this is listening to the voice of the customer, the way I look at this and kind of put it in our context, where sometimes the voice of the customer may not really make sense. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, it's, it's uh, looking at it from the perspective of our customer, thinking about as Muda, is this over-processing? Uh, this is definitely over-processing. You know, is it, is it, is <laughs> yeah. it one of the wastes, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, in, in, a, in a manufacturing environment, obviously I'm, I'm not at all comparing, you know, being in a factory right, right. to potentially yeah. dying in a, a terror Plane, factory. Right, right. I mean, but what I'm saying is, you know, if you look at this from a factory perspective, um, you know, the, the risk of something, or even an FEMA, FMEA, I mean, the risk of something needs to be understood if you're gonna make a change, if you're gonna process something to the point where 
the chances of it are so infinitesimal, and yet you're gonna process it yeah. to the nth degree beyond that, it's like, what degree of infinitesimal do you need to, to get to? <laughs> right, right. I mean, you're never gonna be able to eliminate everything. Yeah. So again, the problem, the question is, what's the cost, what's the benefit? I mean, obviously, again, it's different. A factory is different from a, from a potential right. terrorist attack, but the analog is the chances of something happening. Something well, like this that. also reminds me of the uh, the, cost of, the cost of quality right. chart. So I mean, so you, you could say, and the way I kind of look at this is, is initially you say, well, you gotta have some sort of safety stuff in, in, in place. You gotta have sure. something in place, right? So, so in, initially that, that grabs the low hanging fruit. And then you say, well, okay, so maybe better x-ray. Okay, well, yeah, that's probably makes sense. And maybe the millimeter wave, uh, uh, you know, body scanners, Okay, but at some point you're adding more and more on and the, the incremental benefit you get in terms of safety is being far outstripped by what you're doing in terms of, I don't know, loss of productivity or inconvenience yeah. for the consumer, uh, you know, bad feelings, uh, you know, about, you know, the TSA and body checks and, and all that stuff. There is some point at which the very infinitesimal increase in safety you might be getting is probably not worth it. I right. mean, at, at some point, you just gotta go, look, there's, there's always a way to, to thwart these things. Yeah. And you do your best job, you put the best tools in place, and then at some point, unless something really obvious uh, you know, so somebody comes up with some really obvious way of thwarting security and, and, you know, really opening up a huge gap, well, then you address it then. But I think these, you know, let's ban laptops and yeah. then let's do this and let's do that. I, to me, it, at some point, it just doesn't make sense. Well, they're not banning laptops in domestic flights. No, right it's, it's international flights. Well, and, the yeah. and I didn't understand that quite, but I did a little research on it as well. Apparently, America has really good uh, security here. I mean, our, our security in terms of our scanning, our scanning technology is better than many, much of the scanning technology overseas. So because of that, a laptop can't be as easily smuggled through, or can't be apparently, right, yeah. uh, with these new devices that they are, think may be existing in, amongst the terrorists. Um, right. So that's why in America you can still bring your laptop on a plane. Um, right, domestic flights. Domestic yeah. flights. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know that you will be able to going forward because people may say, no, no, we got to ban that we, here we, too. We, we got to do it. And it, but yeah, it yeah. becomes a point. I, I uh, but I think their main point was that a lot of this is not necessarily driven by by facts. By the logic of it. By, by the logic yeah, of it. It's, it's, it's kind emotional. of like, oh my gosh, you got to do yeah, something. Yeah. So, the, and the politicians got to listen. Yeah. They, they got to go, well, okay, yeah. everybody's, you know, boy, if I don't do something, I'm going to look like, and especially if I don't do something, and immediately on the tails of me not doing something, yeah. there's some sort of, you know, a terrorist yeah. attack, then I'm going to look really bad, and, so I'm going to uh, cover my butt yeah, and, and just do it. And just do it. It's know? all about cost, I mean, cost yeah. benefit is what you're, yeah. what you're saying. It's actually what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because that's exactly what I want to talk in this week's off script. Okay. We have exactly three minutes. Um, but I got a quick, quick intro for you here. Okay. So talking about cost benefits, um, certainly the travel ban, this whole idea of, of, of restricting immigration has been in the news uh, for months now. Okay. Um, part of this that's been in the news, uh, sidelined in the news, has been the, the H-1B visa program. Right. This idea that you know, industry wants people to be able to come to the country. So um, my question to you is, within the framework of industry and, and training and STEM education, all that things, um, the H-1B visa program is controversial. Now, should we should we embrace the H-1B visa program? Should we say, to heck with it and limit it or get rid of it and just try to develop that from within? I mean, what are the options, again, on a cost-benefit analysis basis for having the H-1B program? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I'm not, I don't know all the answers to that. Some people have argued, and I think incorrectly, if I, if I remember this right, that that you know, the H-1B bring, allows them, you know, companies to bring in cheap labor from overseas. My understanding is that is not true, that when those people come in, that part of the agreement on the H-1B visa program is that they have to be paid mm -hmm. a, a, a salary kind of commiserate with, with whatever that position would be. In, a, in other words, they, they can't bring, you know, an, a, 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 you know, an Indian uh, engineer over and pay them $7.50 an hour. Right. Okay, they can't do that. Right. That's my understanding. So um, my feeling is that probably what's going on is what industry has said has been going on 
and who knows, maybe they're lying, but they've been saying that, look, we're going outside for talent because we're not finding it inside. But here's the thing. So then is, is the better solution to develop it inside? Sure, and I think once you develop it inside, then those companies will say, okay, well, awesome. Now I can, I can hire an engineer locally mm -hmm. or from the United States. That's awesome. I don't have to bring him in from overseas, but you have to build that up first, which is a lot of what we're, we've been talking about hammering on for years now education. is the skills gap and education and bringing people up to speed with, with the engineering and tech skills that they need in the United States. So you don't have to go outside, but or you have to do that first. Or it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the broader question is, does it matter? I mean, the, the question is, are we, are we an insulated country that only wants to have workers from within, or are we a part of a broader world, especially for multinational corporations where you want to just have whoever you want working? The answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but the answer is, look, if, if the talent pool is here in the United States, then a, a company, a tech company, let's say, has the option of where they're going to pull from. Now, they're going to make that, that's going to be a business decision for them. They're yeah. going to go, well, look, you know, I got this guy in India. Man, this guy is super talented. He's got skills. I'm not finding that right here. Sure, I'm going to hire him. Or the flip side is, is true. So in other words, I, I think what it does is if you bring up the skills in the United States, and you give the option to companies to hire local or hire from overseas, I got a feeling that that is gonna sh slowly shift to hiring locally, but you gotta give them that option. And yeah. right now, I think, and I, I, I do believe what the, what the companies are saying, I think the reason they're bringing people over on, on H-1Bs is because that's where they're finding the talent. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, I'm not gonna scrounge for six months trying to find somebody locally yeah. that has what I need when I got this guy sitting over in India who's ready to come over right now. Yeah. I mean, it's a business. Decision. And may not even be able to train that person up locally and, ever to the, the level which exactly, I need. Exactly, yeah. 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 Well, you know, has, has it seemed to you, I mean, just uh, as a side, that, that recently the political stuff has been leaching into the industry stuff and vice versa more? I mean, is it just oh, yeah. that we're talking about it more, that we're more aware of it? Or is there a sea change now, and this is just an extension on this question, that there's a sea change where the political climate is such that now industry and what we talk about every day in Quality Digest is more affected by that that culture. I, I do because I don't think I don't think how many people even heard the term H one B two years ago. Yeah. I mean, it was out there, and if you worked in an industry, you've heard about we, it. But all of a sudden, it's like, oh my gosh, yeah. there's these special visas, yeah. and they're like yeah. going out, and they're yeah. bringing people yeah. in, and they're paying them $3.50 an hour, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah. no, nah, it's not yeah. like that. It's been around forever. <laughs> but but there is, I mean, we, there, we there certainly is, have been yeah. focused on it more. Yeah, we, we, there's a lot more, there is a lot more visibility, and I think a lot of it is because of the political climate. There's a lot more interest in, you know, immigration, either legal immigration or illegal immigration. And part of the legal immigration is, is visas, um, and people are looking at that a lot more, and they're not looking, some people aren't looking just at illegal immigrants, they're going, well, wait a minute, no, we shouldn't have people coming in even legally and taking, yeah. our, you know, taking our jobs, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. it's a complicated issue. All right, good job, Dirk, thanks again for that. Good, good off script there, you'll, you'll get one for me next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, wow, that, oh, I guess we're, we're at the end. Okay. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Well, thanks to all of you for joining us. Thanks to Lolly Daskal for, for joining us. She was great. Well, hope, looking forward to getting her on the show again. That's right. And keep your eyes open for more of her articles. She uh, is going to be contributing more. So thanks to all of us, uh, all of you for joining us, and we will see you next Friday. Have a great weekend. So long. Bye.